this is it. This is the third day of Games for Change. It has been an incredible festival. Uh, you know, when I was thinking about the fact that it was going to be online this year, I was like, oh, I'm going to really miss going out in New York City with everybody showing you all my favorite little holes in the wall bars and and hanging. But uh, this is kind of OK, right? Um, I'm speaking to you from a cabin in the woods in the Catskills in New York, upstate New York, uh, a couple hours from New York City. Um, so uh, hopefully there won't be any uh, frightening incidents. Cabin in the woods kind of conjures some of those things. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, I'm Colleen Macklin. I teach at Parsons School of Design. Uh, I also am part of a, a indie game design collective called Local Number 12. We make uh, the Apple Arcade game Dear Reader, uh, which we are so honored was a finalist in this year's Games for Change under guess, Best Gameplay. Um, uh, wow. Uh, it's the first time I've had a game in the festival, actually, even though I've been coming to Games for Change for 14 years now. So it's a big milestone for me. And I feel really, really honored to be a, an attendee, uh, a speaker, and also uh, have one of my games in the, in the festival. Um, so as you know, you can uh, chat and we'll be using the chat for some of this workshop. Uh, I'll be asking you to uh, uh, shout out some things and I'll be um, capturing them um, as well as you can ask to share your video and audio. I think we'll probably reserve that for the Q&A, but we might take a few breaks here and there if there is anything coming up and folks want to ask a question. Um, it's okay if in your, you're in your pajamas. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't be shy. Um, but you can also ask questions via the chat. I'll try my best to keep track of, uh, of the questions. So the chat moves pretty quick. So uh, if I miss it, just ask again. Uh, don't be shy. Oh, Owen, my cat. <laughs> I wonder which one it was. I've got three cats. I think it might have been, uh, <laughs> it might have been, Billy Coco, aka William Coconut, um, who is a new <laughs> new cat of ours. Yes, the black and white one. Uh, we have two black and white cats, and um, uh, they're pretty fantastic. They're best friends. So uh, anyway, um, we're gonna today work together. Uh, it is a workshop. Uh, I'll do my best. I'm used to teaching on Zoom and this platform slightly different. So we can't really do certain things like breakout groups. Um, so we'll be working as a, as a collective. There are 88 of you right now, which is a lucky number. Um, and uh, together, we're going to game the system. We're going to take those real world systems in the world. Uh, and we're going to translate them into uh, actual games. Let's see, is there any other business we need to attend to before I start to fire up? I've got some slides to show you. I'm going to talk for a while, and every once in a while we'll take some breaks. Um, yeah, I think we're good. I, I see here, Carissa, uh, you're in the moderation panel, which means that you might want to share your video and, and audio. Is that is that true? Not sure. Um, if not, you can, uh, I think you can, not sure about that. Yeah, I'm not sure either, Carissa. Here, I'm going to just, I'm going to close you out here uh, and we'll start fresh. I've also got Jack Keen and Marella Caro Zieri uh, showing up here. You might have accidentally pressed the share audio and video button. Um, uh, but it, oh, okay, no problem, Morella. That's fine. I'm gonna just uh, close down the the queue here. Uh, but you will know that you can share your audio and video and join and be on the stage with me if you'd like. Um, when we do a Q and A. Okay, so I've got uh, several things going on here. I've got. Uh, uh, my laptop. I've got an iPad here that shows me you. So when I look in this direction, it's not because I'm looking at another cat of mine. Um, I'm looking at the actual chat. Um, and 
I am going to share my screen and we'll get started. Here we go. All right, now I'm hoping uh, you can see uh, my screen here and also hoping that you can see something that says gaming the system. Now I can't see you anymore. Um, so whatever you say in the chat, I'm not gonna be able to see. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, and I've got, let's see, I've got Adam on my, on my phone in case anything goes awry. So this session is called Gaming the System. Um, we're going to be looking at real world systems, as I mentioned, and we're going to be turning them into games or modeling them through games. Um, I like to also call this, uh, exercise making tiny utopias. Um, and the reason for that is that I think that games are kind of like tiny utopian models of the world. Uh, they make failure fun. So they do this like alchemical process of making failure fun. Oh, I should mention, if you want to see the slides bigger, you can double click on that screen and it will show bigger on your screen. Um, they're deliciously unproductive, I'd say. Um, I quote uh, Bernie DeCoven, uh, God bless him uh, and rest in peace, Bernie. Uh, an embellishment on the shape of necessity uh, is one of the ways that he describes games, that it's actually not a necessary thing like food and water and shelter, um, but the games are kind of a, a wonderful embellishment, a graffito, he names them. And games, instead of telling us what we can't do, the rules in games actually free us to try new stuff. And I think it was Tracy Fullerton uh, in her book, um, Game Design Workshop, that said something along the lines of, um, think about designing rules that, that lets players do things they can't normally do in real life. Like, what is the thing the player gets to do? And I think that's a really good bit of advice. Um, and I think that uh, that's why games are like these little tiny utopias. Um, a bit of history here in terms of systems. This is a screenshot of a game that I made with a group of students um, that uh, was about the Electoral College. And basically it had you going from state to state trying to win electoral votes based on certain issues. So here you see uh, the Democratic player on the left and the Republican player on the right. Um, and they're choosing different issues to battle each other with. Um, sorry, my phone's ringing. Uh, and uh, so for instance, the Democratic player has chosen, uh, this was back in 2004. So they chose same-sex marriage, uh, the economy and national security, whereas the Republican player chose terrorism, national security and uh, the economy. Um, it was kind of like a, a warlike battle uh, in a way. It was fast paced and you were just trying to pick up as many electoral college votes as you could. Um, it was a flash game. It's no longer available to play, sadly. Um, I just have some screenshots and videos of it. Um, but the reason I'm showing this is because when I am set out to make this game, uh, University president at the time, Bob Carey at the new school where I teach said, uh, I want you to make a game about the electoral college. And I just said, yes. And I immediately left wondering how the heck do I make a game about the electoral college? I'd made some games before I'd made some other interactive stuff, uh, but nothing about something that exists in the world. So I immediately called a former student of mine who'd started a game company. And I said, it was Wade Tenney. And I said, Wade, how do I make a game about the Electoral College? And he said to me four words that have changed the way I think of games uh, since then. He said, start with the system. And that's what we did. We looked at the Electoral College and how it works. We looked at it from the perspective of a candidate and what they're thinking in terms of gaming that system to their advantage. And we made a game out of it. Um, 
there's a longer story there about uh, how the president of our university felt about the game. Uh, he thought it was too fun. <laughs> we can go into that at some other time. Um, but that really kind of led me in this journey of thinking about real world systems and how they can be modeled in games. And so I created a research lab centered around that called Pet Lab, where we make games about everything from activism to the federal deficit. Um, I'll talk a little more about some of these projects, in particular Budget Ball, which is a physical, fiscal sport played in Washington, DC, uh, to create awareness among college students about the federal debt. Uh, here I am learning some games in Uganda uh, as part of a Red Cross project where we learned games and we translated them with, uh, with uh, folks uh, into games about disaster preparedness. And here's a game about the human microbiome I did with MIT uh, and um, who knew you could make a fun game about the human microbiome, but uh, you can. <laughs> so anyway, systems. Um, briefly, uh, you know, a system, oh, hang on. Oh, <laughs> I'm in presenter mode. All right, well, that's great. Then you can see what's coming up next. Hang on one second here. All right. <laughs> Apologies to everyone. Uh, I have no way of seeing you, so uh, it makes this a little bit complicated. Um, let me try again to share my screen. Again, apologies here. I'm going to try it this way. All right. You might see a very interesting way that I see my screen. But now hopefully, do you see the whole screen? Sorry, bear with me, folks. This is uh, a wonderful system for uh, audience members, but for speakers, it's a little challenging to navigate. Adam, how does that look? You can text me because I can't see uh, I can't see the the session chat. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Adam. And thank you all for bearing with me. I apologize for the uh, uh, clumsiness on my part. Okay, so a system uh, is an interconnected set of elements that's coherently organized in a way that achieves something. Uh, and there are three things in a system, elements, interconnections, and a function or purpose. This is a quote from Danella Meadows, Thinking in Systems. And if there's anything I can impart today, go get this book and read it. Um, Danella Meadows is kind of like, God, if I could name like my major influencers, they'd have to be Bernie DeCove and Danella Meadows. And uh, I'm sure I can think of some more, but those two are at the top of influences in, in games for me and the way of, I think about games. Uh, <clears throat> Meadows is uh, no longer with us, uh, died of uh, complications from breast cancer a few years ago, but studied with Jay Forrester at MIT uh, and is one of the sort of major figures in systems dynamics. This is Danella Meadows' simple definition of systems. And we're going to, when we map them and make them into games, we're going to think about these three elements, ele three things, elements, interconnections, and the system's function or purpose. And let, let me explain that for a minute. One of the things that Meadows talks about in the book is that we see a lot of headlines, right? And we see a lot of uh, stories in the newspaper, but those are really stories in a way of the symptoms of a system. We're not fully understanding the system underlying things like the coronavirus, uh, through a story, but we're understanding the symptoms, we're understanding the outcomes of that system, what they produce. Now we're getting closer if we look at the New York Times uh, sort of daily map of new cases and new deaths in terms of uh, the coronavirus in the United States and in the world. Um, we're seeing upward trends, we're seeing uh, where things are rising, 
we're kind of getting a better sense of actually the kind of mechanics of the system itself. And then, as I said, through the stories, we're getting an indication of the symptoms. So, for instance, this was a few days ago, kind of threw the academic world into turmoil. Um, Trump administration was trying to revoke visas for foreign students for taking online courses. Thankfully, that's been withdrawn. Um, but that's one symptom of a system, right? It's not directly related to the coronavirus cases and if they're increasing and decreasing, but that system is kind of setting into action other systems. Um, this one I thought was really interesting. This was, uh, I think, on the same day that the lockdowns had spared millions of animals from becoming roadkill. Yet again, another symptom of the si system of this virus and its transmission through the United States and what that means. We can begin to depict systems. This is Two Minute Medicine, which is a great website for doctors in two minutes, kind of learning about the latest things in healthcare. Um, I think they do a pretty nice job of uh, summing up the aspects of the coronavirus. And the World Economic Forum, of course, uh, has some resources in terms of COVID-19 and its impacts. And I think this is a particularly prescient uh, mapping of COVID-19 because it not only maps uh, cases and their transmission, but it maps the impact on financial markets uh, and even systemic racism and how uh, COVID-19 is connected to systemic racism. So you can begin to navigate all the various ways in which one system connects to other systems. So that's part of it. Uh, and part of the challenge is that systems are interconnected. I like to use this visual aid when I think about systems in the world, real world systems and games. Um, in my perspective, uh, real world systems are like tigers. Uh, they're fairly, they're dangerous. They have real impacts and effects on human life. Um, games are like tigers, um, but they're much less harmful. We can fail safely. Uh, they're kind of like a kitten and marshmallows, as you see here. Um, and we can learn a little bit about how that tiger acts in the real world, but we can do so safely. Um, so uh, actually there was an interesting case where someone recently uh, was attacked by a mountain lion in Colorado. His name was Travis Kaufman. And he had a new kitten um, for about six months prior to this attack. And he realized that actually kittens like to get on their back and kind of like scratch with their back legs to, uh, it, it's just an instinct they have. And in the real world, if that if mountain lion did that, it would be very dangerous because it would claw you. Um, and so he learned how to avoid dying from this mountain lion attack by having a kitten. So it actually works in, in, in life too, in some cases. But essentially what I'm saying here is that games are safe, accessible, understandable models of real world systems. They're not the same, uh, they're domesticated, so to speak. And then finally, um, this is a game that I showed uh, on the first day of the conference, uh, part of Nikki Case's Explorable Explanations, here is a way to model uh, uh, COVID-19 and the coronavirus. I have a few more slides and then we'll break a minute and I'll let you ask some questions uh, about this content. Uh, finally, I do wanna say that the great thing about games is that they enable failure. In fact, they're, built on failure. I think a game designer's job is making failure fun. Uh, Jesper Yule, in his wonderful book, The Art of Failure, says that video games are the art of failure, which I think is really interesting. And if we've played this game, if there's anything we've learned, is that running into this uh, kind of mushroom guy is uh, not a good thing. Um, and we might learn that over and over and over and over again. Um, as we're playing. And finally, we'll realize that if we jump on top of his head, uh, we'll be okay. 
All right, I'm gonna, um, let's see, I've got a couple more, a couple more slides real quick. Uh, this is a mapping from uh, a book project John Sharp and I did called Iterate, 10 Lessons in Design and Failure. I am obsessed with failure. Uh, this is the iterative game design cycle where you prototype something, you, well, you conceptualize it, then you prototype it, then you test it and it breaks. And it's only through that failure that you actually see the things that you need to work on and improve in your game. It's similar with any kind of design process, right? It's a meandering path through failure to the actual thing itself. I like to say failure is a flashlight. It illuminates the design of things. Uh, when you push that door and it's supposed to be pulled, you realize that there's some kind of design flaw in that door itself. I, I swear I do that still all the time. And creativity at, at large is kind of a process of iterating through ideas and failing um, and through that failure, arriving somewhere better than where you, where you started, hopefully. Uh, failing better, as uh, Beckett would say. This is just a quote from the book. I'll take a minute to drink some coffee and you can read this quote. So as we say, failure is the fuel that keeps that creative uh, engine running. It's the reason we prototype things and test them out first. Today, we're gonna do this. We're gonna find the system that we wanna map, change, and game. Uh, so these four steps are what we're gonna, what we're gonna work on. Um, and so the first part of that is figuring out what we need to fix and just hang on for a second. I'm gonna ask in the chat for you to uh, go ahead and offer up some systems that we need to fix, but not yet, because I can't see the chat. Um, and uh, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna stop sharing. And now I can see you. Okay, um, hopefully that made sense. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to jot, jump in. Sandy, racism, okay, I'm writing these down. Um, let me just... All right, oh my gosh, prison industrial complex. Plastic use, teaching model, resilient urban systems, the electoral college, affordable, healthy foods, healthcare. Oh yeah, plus one racism. I'm seeing a plus one here. Uh, money and politics, the U.S. <laughs> yes, that is a system that needs fixing. Uh, simulate if Yang was president. Um, I'm a member of the Yang gang. I love Yang. I think Yang is awesome. Um, so what do we need not? <laughs> what do we not need to fix, Stephen? I have no idea. Money and politics. Oh, poo in public places, Jeremiah. Yeah, that's an issue. Uh, elections, capitalism. Oh my gosh. You're describing all some really incredible, important, and very large systems that we need to fix. Healthcare, childcare, elder care, your back garden. <laughs> Weeding, police brutality. These are all like absolutely incredible, um, uh, incredible systems that do need fixing. Um, what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to share something. Oh, gosh. The president's brain? Yeah, I don't think that's a system that can be fixed. Sorry. <laughs> um, all right. Here we go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share uh, a whiteboard here. Um, okay, so we've got a lot of things here. We've got uh, election finance. I'll never be able to write these uh, as fast as, as... Do we have any folks who are actually, oh, sugar addiction. <laughs> um, We've got game addiction. <laughs> uh, lack of creative thought, that is a good one. Um, Ruthie, yeah, you're gonna have to just write all this stuff down and then maybe you can fall asleep at, with peace. Um, surveillance capitalism. Uh, 
uh, teaching. Oh gosh. Oh wow. Sorry for my bad handwriting. Dictatorships. I definitely saw racism earlier. Domestic violence. Oh, militarization of the police. Let's just say police here. That'll be, we can include militarization. Um, healthcare, public health, health. Climate change, I mean, yeah, that's a big one, right? And it's, we're just not, we're not doing anything right now, uh, in my opinion. It's kind of upsetting. Um, voter disenfranchisement, mental health, stigmas about mental health. I'm just gonna write these social media literacy. Yeah, oh my God. All right, okay, we've got a lot on, up here. Um, voter disenfranchisement. Um, so normally what I would do during this workshop, if uh, those of you who are educators wanna kind of get an insight into some ways that you could, you could uh, at this point um, begin uh, narrowing down these systems. Normally what I would do is break folks into groups. So anyone who plus one on an issue would join the person who originally suggested that issue and then you would form groups. There are 162 of you and we're in this weird uh, format. So I'm not gonna be able to do that. Um, but what I'd like to do, uh, these are all really awesome systems that we need to fix. Um, so I think uh, I'm not really an expert in a lot of these systems. And one of the first things I try to do when I'm gaming the system is actually find an expert, um, find several experts. Because uh, speaking from experience, certain people have different political views and different perspectives on these things. So uh, you wanna get as many angles into the issue uh, as possible. Um, so find an expert first off in one of these issues like racism or domestic violence, uh, the militarization of police, et cetera. Let's, why don't we focus on, I've been, I've been doing some reading and thinking about, um, well, since this is Games for Change, maybe we want to, focus on something related to games. Uh, we could focus on, on game addiction. Gosh, that's a tough one. Uh, but I feel like that's one we could, we could start with. Is that okay? Does that sound all right? I mean, you can tell me, we could also do police. Uh, we could do some of the bigger ones too. Um, oh, who's our expert? <laughs> Diversity in games too. That is really key. And in fact, um, uh, oh, Sarah, you want to do police, huh? Uh, all right, let's 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 just get some uh, diversity in games hits home. Yeah, Kavon, I agree. Let's do diver, I'm sorry, we're going to do diversity in games, but I, I promise you um, that uh, hopefully at the end of this workshop, you'll have some of your own tools to be able to take on some of these issues that you really passionately care about. So we're going to do diversity in games. Um, and so I'm gonna make a new document here. I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna show you a few examples of some systems maps that we're gonna use to make our system. So we found our system. We know what we need to fix. Uh, we need to fix diversity in games. Um, and so what I like to usually, uh, let's see, what I like to usually do is identify the problem the place and the publics, so the three Ps um, of that particular system. So the problem is we don't have diversity in games, especially within uh, the development community, right? So we can kind of begin to delve into that problem, do some research. 
the place where what is the place well i guess in terms of this the place is really um the workplace right in some ways it's also representation in games i mean we have a couple of different ways we could look at this issue uh you know and i think that the representation issue aka having more diverse uh characters in games more diverse perspectives in games kind of starts from the workplace because we need more game developers who are black indigenous people of color lgbtq uh, neurodiverse, uh, you know, from a variety of, of perspectives. So I'm going to say the place is the workplace and the public, game game playing publics, I think, really, because, uh, you know, the, the problem with not having a diverse uh, kind of workplace in games is that uh, players don't get to play amazing games that represent their own perspectives and viewpoints. So I'd like to start with a question, how might we, in this case, I would say, how might we increase diversity in games? I think that's fairly simple. Um, and we're going to map the system. So the biggest question when you're mapping the system is where do you draw the lines? Uh, to begin, this is Jay Forrester, who I mentioned, uh, worked with Danella Meadows in systems dynamics. Um, here he is holding one of his own systems maps. What I love about this image of Jay Forrester, who really is considered the sort of originator of systems dynamics, is that uh, this map is really messy and it's impossible to read. Uh, I do see pollution there, maybe food, a couple of other things. Um, but to be honest, the symbols in the drawing, it's, it's a mess and that's great because I think the only way we can fully begin to understand the system is to just start trying to draw it. Um, here's an image of Mark Lombardi, who's an artist who, whose work is really about mapping systems and uncovering corruption uh, in politics. Here we see the source is from uh, The Big Fix, Inside Job, uh, which I think was a documentary. And here Mark Lombardi is trying to map the systems that were described in that documentary. Um, this is an early version of a Mark Lombardi piece. This is in the collection at MoMA. Here's a later one. You can begin to see that the systems maps become even more complex and more um, intertwined and kind of more beautiful in a way. I think that his drawing style uh, changed. And then everybody knows these kinds of maps. <laughs> from the uh, television show, popular TV show, Homeland, uh, or any FBI agent is obviously making these maps. What I love about this image is that these maps are color-coded, or the, the, the sections are color-coded, which is a very nice design touch. And then finally, this is an example of the kind of mapping that Danella Meadows describes in the book, Thinking and Systems, which you should just go out and get. Um, you see a few different, um, lines with arrows. This is a map I like to show my students because it's about your creative potential. Uh, so usually the kind of goal of the system, remember those three parts, elements, interconnections, and goals. The goal is in the center, and then we see stuff coming in. The most important thing in this map, in my opinion, are the clouds on the outer edge. The clouds show you the other systems that we're not going to be able to map because if you started mapping one thing, it would be Borgesian. You'd be mapping the whole world. Uh, because clearly diversity in games is a larger systemic issue um, and connects to systemic racism, bias, and all kinds of other things. Um, but we're not going to be able to map all of it. So we're going to put clouds on the outer edge of our map. The other thing I want to note is the little, are the little like Wiley E. Coyote looking dynamite detonators. That's not what they are. They're actually faucets. And uh, Meadows calls these uh, flow, uh, stock and flow, meaning you can increase the flow of these things or decrease the flow in these things and they in, impact the whole system. So the, the easy one to explain is sleep. If you don't get enough sleep, your creative potential goes down. If you get enough sleep, your creative potential goes up, right? Uh, but if you get too much, 
then it goes down again. So there's really an interesting nonlinear relationship between those things. All right, uh, that's it for that. Um, okay, so does this all make sense? Why? They do look like Wiley E. Coyote detonators, <laughs> Dokia. Um, all right, sorry, Sandy, if you can't see the screen, gosh. Well, this will be recorded, I believe, so hopefully you can refer to it again. If not, I'm happy to do it again <laughs> someday. All right. So let's map our system. Let's figure out how we actually uh, of, um, make sense of this particular thing in games. All right. Okay, here we go. Oh, actually. I'm gonna think that this would be tricky, but we're gonna make it work. Bear with me, here we go. All right, you should be able to kind of see my 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 whiteboard here. And so in the spirit of the kind of Danello Meadows style map, um, I'm gonna go ahead. Let me, Organize this so that it's a little better. I'm going to go ahead and put in the middle here um, lack of diversity in games. Okay, so that'll be at the center of our uh, systems map. Um, now, we are going to go ahead and just map the problem. Uh, and then at some point, maybe we can start gaming that problem and finding solutions. So yeah, if you double click, thank you, Owen. If you double click on the, on the whiteboard, you can see it bigger. OK, so we start with our problem in the center. We start with the kind of behavior or outcome of the system. Meadows also calls it the goal of the system. It, it's a little sad to say that the goal of uh, the game industry is a lack of diversity in games, but unfortunately, I think because of systemic racism and other elements, that's kind of how the system works right now. So let's connect a few elements to this that obviously impact lack of diversity in games. Um, I like to think about this in terms of nouns, verbs, and adjectives. Um, the nouns involved in the system, if some folks could, yeah, the goal is definitely going to be to increase diversity in games, um, which we can actually, you know what? I actually like, Nicholas, I like this idea. Let's Let's just fix it from the start. I was going to have us like just map the problem, but let's make diversity in games. <laughs> it makes me happier to do that. So what do we have to do in order to create diversity in games? What are some of the elements involved? And in this way, I think of the nouns. Um, can someone can someone say uh, access? OK. OK, that's one of them. Uh, Mentors, awareness. Again, I'm not going to be fast enough for you guys, but I'll try my best. Uh, exposure. Yeah. Is, is that exposure to the in industry, uh, Kavan? Is that what you meant? Funding. Gosh, money. Exposure to the opportunities. I got gotcha. you. OK. Um, education. As an educator, I like that. So we can begin to even think about um, so equity in education, so improve acceptance of diverse students in university CS programs and in game design programs. This is so important. Um, absolutely. Tolerance. 
you know, we could we could just put in racism because honestly, it has an impact here. Um, if we can somehow decrease racism, we can hopefully increase diversity in games. But there are other elements in the system that have to be changed too, right? Um, newcomer welcoming, prejudice, culture. Yeah, oh gosh, you know, when a company says you're not the right fit for the culture, what does that even mean, right? Um, finance, yeah, uh, funding, let's say funding and finance, because that could be funding for scholarships, which could hopefully overcome on education. Resources, yes. As we were talking, I spilled my coffee all over the place. It's pretty funny. Misogyny. Yeah, because it's not just, uh, you know, we're talking about, um, oh, wow, I can't spell that word. Oh, that's pretty good. Okay. Um, work visas. Yeah, uh, immigration, right? That's a big one. Thanks for that. Uh, local bias. Let's put bias as its own thing. So already I think we can begin to see representation via art and voice. Okay, representation is a big one. Maybe that also relates to culture from the perspective of games as culture. Apologies for my handwriting. Okay. Business models. All right, so as you can see, we can go all day uh, kind of mapping out all of the elements in this system. Um, but now it's time for us, I think, we can begin to make the interconnections. And this is key, right? So, you know, we can see here that uh, most of these elements have a direct connection to diversity in games. So racism impacts diversity in games. And if we made our little Wiley E. Coyote detonator, which is actually a faucet that increases or decreases flows, obviously we can see that the more racism that exists in a particular place, um, the less apt uh, game developers of color are going to be hired. So we can see that there's a direct relationship, right? Thank you, Kavan, for the handwriting support. Um, so we see that this is a direct relationship. So more racism, actually indirect, sorry, inverse. More racism leads to less diversity. So we need to bring that down. Um, funding and finance, obviously if we increase funding and finance around games uh, that are created by underrepresented groups, then we increase the diversity in games, right? Um, so, you know, I'm going to just like make our own little notation. So we need to decrease racism. We need to increase funding and finance. We'll put a plus sign there, a minus sign there. Um, and awareness. I'm going to just put circles around these things. Um, yeah, even awareness that you could uh, find a, a career we're, Scott, we're going to use Loopy <laughs> later. Um, that uh, to find a career in 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 game development, I mean, most people don't even know that's accessible or or possible for them, right? So we need to. The relationship here is um, is interesting. So here's an interesting one. So. If we increase awareness, we have more diversity in games and it goes the other way, more diversity in games and there's more awareness, right? So we begin to see also how more diversity in games can begin to combat racism, perhaps through cultural shifts. Um, and if you add funding and finance for diversity in games and make successful games, then you generate new, more money. So I haven't mapped all of these things yet, um, but I don't want us to run out of time. Uh, as you can see, this process leads to a lot of other ideas and thoughts um, and 
it takes some time to decide what are the levers we want to focus on if we model this system in a game. And so I'd like to say that, uh, uh, oh, machinations.io, Scott uh, Clovon, uh, I'm interested in that. I'll have to look at that. Andrew, I'm going to bring back the noun, verb, and adjective piece in a second. Right now, we've pretty much mapped nouns, right? Like racism, bias, culture. I would say they're, they're nouns. Um, we've mapped their relationships. And through the relationships, we can begin to identify verbs. So for instance, um, uh, Invest might be a verb here under funding and finance, right? Or for awareness, um, you know, that could, you know, you want to create awareness, right? Um, I don't, I like specific verbs. So if I were thinking through and brainstorming on how do we create a game about creating awareness that we need diversity in games and that you can, uh, uh, be a game maker, no matter who you are. Um, create might be one of the verbs I'm thinking about, but the thing is games are made of verbs. So I would want to think more specifically, like maybe other ways, like share. Um, maybe it's uh, spread, spreading awareness, sharing awareness. Uh, consult, expose. So we're beginning to kind of get some more evocative verbs here, connect, empower. And we can kind of like a, like a, like a switchboard operator, right? Begin to kind of like plug in, expose here more exposure of diversity in games raises awareness, right? So we can begin to kind of think about our system map in terms of connecting these, these verbs. But I think the verb piece is something you don't always see on systems maps only because uh, when we make games, we're making verbs. So I like to include them. I think it's important. All right, and then the adjective we'll get to. The adjective is something that kind of comes out of the system. The system is an engine for creating certain kinds of visceral experiences that can be described through adjectives. Um, and I hope I'm not getting too complicated. If I am, I can back up. But uh, it might be time to take a moment and get to the next step, modeling this as a game. Um, I'm going to look at my slides and see what I've got here that could be helpful. Uh, yeah, OK, OK, we're going to get this. Um, all right, just going to share. Stop sharing that and start sharing something else. Ooh, I think I'm getting a little better at this. All right. Nouns, verbs, and adjectives. All right. So we talked about nouns, verbs, and adjectives. And it really, like a brainstorming session where you're actually writing down as many nouns, verbs, and adjectives that are related to this um, system as possible is a really, really fruitful thing to do. Um, and I would highly recommend it. Usually this workshop takes a full day when I do it. So we're kind of zooming past some stuff. I am hoping to write a book <laughs> that focuses on how to do this. Um, so someday, someday, let's game the system. All right, here's an example. So this is a, a perhaps not, not the most politically correct example from one of my students, but that's okay. They're students and they're learning. Um, because when you think of deportation as a game, it's a little bit, it makes you feel a little weird. It's not great. Um, but I teach a course called Gaming the System, the Political Potential of Play at Parsons. And it's a lecture course with a, 
uh, over 100 students from across the university from different fields. So they might be studying fashion design or politics or psychology or liberal arts. Um, and we make games about real world systems. And this is a map of one of the real world systems that one of my students wanted to make a game about. Um, and I asked them to take a game that they love and turn it into a game about this thing. So they're starting not from scratch. They're starting from a game that exists and they're changing the rules of that game. They're changing the play space of that game. They're changing some of the verbs of that game, the narrative around it uh, in order to um, really better understand that real world issue. Because to me, game design is one great way of learning how systems work, not only in games, but in the world. Um, and that's kind of, I feel like, one of my missions as an educator is uh, exposing students to things beyond what they're thinking about in terms of how the world works. Here you see this uh, student on the right-hand side in, in, with the drawing. Um, they're looking at the people, actions, objects, rules, play space, and goal. Um, this has precedent in the game design book that John Sharp and I wrote called Games Design and Play. And I'm gonna explain each one real briefly. Um, you see a little drawing of uh, how this game is set up uh, with a little key where you have citizens. Uh, I don't like the idea of a legal immigrant. Let's just say immigrant, Trump, police, green card. Uh, you could say ICE instead of police maybe. So we could begin to talk through these issues with students. Um, and as they're putting them down like this, you can begin to um, learn, right, how the system works. And on the left is their final game, uh, which involved having a kind of passport and different visas, which will enable you, you to do different things and constrain you in, in certain ways. And it was a race, basically, to get to the uh, end goal. All right, so uh, take a game of soccer, for instance. Uh, actually, this is um, uh, this is Australian rules uh, football, uh, or what is it called? Oh God, one of you is saying it in the chat, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, so uh, uh, this is a game that has specific rules that uh, I, as an American, am not as familiar with, but uh, involve passing the ball in certain ways, kicking the ball, blocking offensive, defensive teams. There are rules about how many players there can be on a team, et cetera. So we think of games, we think of the rules first, because they're kind of like the underlying mechanism uh, of the game. We think of actions like running, passing, shouting here. I think I see some people like yelling, throw it to me. There are goals, so there's like an end goal. You have to get the ball to a place and that's how you score a point. So that is the goal. End the game with the most points. There's objects. Here we have uh, the football or the ball itself. Um, we, we have, uh, everyone's wearing cleats, right? Uh, and uniforms that indicate the team that they're coming from. We have a play space, which is the field, and the field usually has demarcation about what's in and out of bounds. And finally, we have the players um, who are the most important thing, because without players, you don't have a game. So that is essentially, uh, a, it is Aussie rules. Thank you, Oscar. <laughs> rugby, rugby, Australian rules football. Whew. I, I love showing a sport I know nothing about. It's really great. Um, so those are the elements of games. And if you're curious, want a better explanation of that, um, you can grab that book that John and I wrote. Um, but when I'm designing a game about that kind of system, maybe we start to think about what are the rules inherent in diversity in games, right? Um, what are the things that constrain players in this space? So one example of a rule in diversity in games is um, probably that you need to be able to demonstrate some skill, right? Um, so 
we could begin to unpack what does skill mean? What kind of skills are demonstrated, right? Um, maybe one of the ways to crack this issue is to redefine um, a little bit of what sort of typical skills in the game industry are and unpack those things and see where those assumptions about skills can discriminate. Um, being able to communicate. Uh, yep, Jeremy, that's a big one. Um, so we can begin to identify rules, right? And we could create a game where we basically identify different skills. And by acquiring those skills, maybe collecting them, um, maybe this is a scavenger hunt or a choose your own adventure game. By collecting those skills, you gain entry, but perhaps we take the skills and we, we, as I said, we unpack them, we question them. So knowing how to program is one skill, but maybe communication skills and literacy around communication is another one. Um, and maybe we find out that we can value some more than others, right? Um, how about new viewpoints or new perspectives? Maybe that's a specific skill you bring to the table. Um, so that's how I would begin to identify the, the rules in the game and begin to think about other games that exist that I could begin to play with. And the reason I usually try to start with a different game uh, and modify a different game, like hide and seek, as you saw earlier that my student used, or maybe a scavenger hunt or uh, like a classic choose your own adventure is because from that, you can begin to see how those, those rules interact with your concept and see if it fits. And if it does, uh, then at least you've got to start. You're not working with a blank slate. I think as a game designer, we're oftentimes building off of other games and other experiences. Um, so we could play a game where we're acquiring skills uh, and trying to find them in a, in a space, a play space. Um, and that we're finding out that some skills are valued more than others. Maybe we're, you know, there's two ways you could game this system. One way is to depict it as a, a system that is not enlightened. Um, or the other way would be to depict it as a, like as the ideal system, as the kind of utopian version of diversity in games. So there's two ways to do it. And Christina, it is possible to talk about really sensitive real world issues in a game, but um, it does generate controversy largely because of cultural perceptions of games themselves, that they're playthings, that um, they're not serious, um, and that they are inconsequential. Um, even some of the definitions of games describe games as inconsequential, but I actually think that you can make games about controversial issues. We've worked in Pet Lab with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, and one of the ways that we've had to navigate this, this perception of games is that we don't always call them games. Um, I'd like to be able to call them games, but not everyone games literate as everyone at the Games for Change conference. So interactive experiences, I think, are a way to describe them. But it's also having some rules yourself about what you can and can't do in terms of modeling systems. Um, we can't simulate, uh, you know, truly uh, painful historic experiences um, and do them justice. So maybe what we have to do is use actual documentary, actual real experiences. Um, rather than inventing them ourselves. Um, so we had certain rules, especially when working with issues around the Holocaust. Um, and yeah, Brenda Romero's work is exceptional here. Um, I, I shy away from simulation in many cases. I like to 
try to model a system and then create a conversation about it afterwards. And this is the most, like another big rule I have is if you're modeling systems in your games, you have to talk about them after you play them. If you really wanna get across an educational message about that system, transfer, meaning knowledge transfer from the game to the real world won't happen automatically. It's really an important thing to have a conversation about that system. So, reflection, Sabrina, yeah. Um, so, with that said, um, I want to really, gosh, we zoomed through a whole hour. I can't believe many of you have stayed here with me today. Uh, uh, gosh, it's so much better to do this in person. But let me show you a few final rules of thumb, uh, things that I try to do, um, and that I work with John Sharp. Uh, at Pet Lab and many other students and faculty at the new school. Um, so I do want to also say it's a team effort. This is not something that's just like in my head, it's something that we share as a process. Okay, so a few final slides. I'll keep them minimal so we can do Q&A at the end. Hang on. There we go. We're gonna... So we didn't really make a, a, a specific game, but if we had a little more time, we would definitely do that. Um, one of the things I like about making games about systems is that you can see the parts that don't work um, and begin to change that system and then start to see what changes to systems make the most impact. Um, I'm going to shout out to Kate Raworth's work as an economist. She's my favorite economist. I, I kind of like an armchair economist. I, I, I like to read about economics, I guess, because they're kind of gamey. I'm not going to show this video, but you should definitely look it up. Um, uh, donut economics is Kate Raworth's model for uh, trying to, and it's actually a, a systems drawing for trying to understand what the sweet spot is, the actual donut, um, to have a good life, uh, be economically and environmentally sustainable. Um, so it takes the idea of capitalism, which is growth, growth, growth is the goal. It's just to grow. Um, and it says, hey, at what point is growth not good? Uh, how much do we need to grow? Let's try to find that sweet spot. So Raworth is incredible. Now, Danella Meadows has this concept of leverage points. They're places in any system where a little shift can produce big changes. It's a lever, right? Levers are that. They, they use physics, the power of physics, to make a small movement and make a bigger change. Meadows uses this uh, image um, that show like, uh, inflows and outflows, the state of the system, what we think the state of the system is, what the goal of the system is, and how to, you know, deal with that discrepancy. So um, this might be a little tricky without, without us delving into this in too much detail, but all I'll say is that um, the goal and the the state we perceive of the system is oftentimes there's a discrepancy there. We have to change uh, what we're putting into and getting out of the system. This long list, though, is the most important thing when we think about leverage points. And the most effective leverage points are the ones that are at the end of this list. Number one, the power to transcend paradigms. Kate Raworth, the economist, uses uh, the paradigm of capitalism uh, as an example of a system that's gone amok, that's, that's problematic. Uh, the paradigm of capitalism is growth at all costs. Um, if we were to transcend that paradigm and say, hey, wait a minute, capitalism shouldn't be about that. It should be about a good life for as many people as possible. Then we change the system. That is the, the easiest way to change that's the most effective way to change the system, but it's actually the hardest thing to accomplish. The easiest thing to accomplish is to change some constants, like some of the numbers. Let's tax imports or exports, or let's subsidize the creation of solar power. 
Um, these things have an impact, but they uh, are working within the same system and the same paradigm. So oftentimes they don't make the uh, needed change. It's those top three, the goal of the system, uh, the, the sort of whole mindset that the system comes out of, and then the power to actually get out of that mindset that are the most powerful. This is an orrery, uh, which is a fancy way of saying a map of the solar system. Um, one thing I'm gonna say about modeling systems, you can never model the whole thing, and it oftentimes is inaccurate. This orrery is not accurate. It shows one thing about the system. It shows the revolution of planets around the sun. Uh, and this was a big paradigm shift, right? Um, uh, the heliocentric model went against uh, the thought of the time that the earth was at the center, that we're, we're at the center of everything. Copernicus was like, no, wait, the sun is. Um, and that was a major, major controversy. But then you could begin to model the solar system and you could start to see for your own eyes how planets revolve around the sun. However, it doesn't show the, the solar system at, at the right scale. So for instance, if you're looking at uh, uh, if you're if you're looking at the planets by scale and you were to map and make an orrery, um, Pluto would be miles away. So it kind of break the, the the ability for the system to show us revolution because the scale would be too big. So John Sharp and I call that faithful abstraction. We need to be faithful to what we're trying to show in the system. We need to show at least that part accurately, but it is an abstraction and it's always an abstraction. The world is way more complex than we can ever model it. Um, I won't show the video, but this is budget ball a game. I said I'd talk about a little bit more. It's basically a physical fiscal sport about the federal deficit that for several years uh, was played on the National Mall in Washington, DC. It's no longer played, but um, it was to create awareness about debt. The funny thing about this game is that, um, and it's kind of like a, uh, we built it off of uh, Ultimate Frisbee, so you can't run and tackle people. We didn't want anyone to get hurt, and we wanted it to be accessible to everyone. Um, so you have to, when you catch the ball, you have to pass it and get into your scoring zone, and you can see that there's different, you know, offensive, defensive players, and they stay in their zone. But we added uh, power-ups, so you can add a defensive player, but you have to pay $8. And this is uh, negotiated by the team between gameplay periods. Uh, but in order to, uh, uh, that puts you in debt, those power-ups. But in order to get out of the debt, you have to take sacrifices uh, and earn money back. So one of the players has to hold the egg and you lose a player if it touches the ground. So there's a big sacrifice, a big penalty. Um, Nikki Case made a tool called Loopy uh, that is absolutely incredible. And I actually made um, a version of this uh, map, which I'm gonna stop sharing. Let's see if I can share my entire screen. So this actually shows you, um, Loopy is a great systems mapping tool for stocks and flows for showing the increase and decrease of, of, of elements. Um, so, you know, if we raise taxes, it feels constraining like a sacrifice, right? We lower taxes, it feels great. But look, it increases the federal debt and it feels great, it feels empowering, right? So you can begin to just even see those simple relationships between elements here. This is the system that we were, that's the system that we were mapping in Budget Ball. And I guess the biggest lesson for me is that you can't map every single thing affiliated with the federal deficit uh, and still have the game, at least we couldn't figure out how to do that and still have the game be fun. So instead, we took the big lever going into debt, getting out of debt, 
and modeled it in a sport. And here's where adjectives come in. We wanted it to feel great to get into debt because it does feel great to go into debt. You can go on that vacation. Uh, the government can like give money <laughs> to people. That feels great. Um, but at some point, if you want to balance the budget, you've got to take sacrifices and that doesn't feel great. And usually that's in the form of taxes um, or paying something down. So that's where adjectives come into play. It's that emotional gut uh, experience of a games system that happens when we as human beings interact with that system. Um, so you can begin to see where the nouns, the elements of the system, the verbs, the mechanics, the way they're connected, and then the adjectives, the experience of that system come into play. Uh, let's see, I think we're almost done here. Um, uh, if there's anything else I really wanna share. Oh, yeah, I think we're good. Um, I wanna say that uh, uh, if you have any questions about this stuff, I, I am obsessed with systems and games and their emotional impacts. So they don't have to be these cold mechanical things that they actually generate feelings, right? Systemic racism obviously generates pain, <laughs> generates certain kinds of feelings. Um, uh, and I think that uh, if we can begin to connect these kind of systems that we create for ourselves with the actual outcomes and the way they feel, then we can begin to truly want to change them. Um, so hopefully that's a good uh, way to kind of close things out. Um, T. Nguyen, Nguyen uh, who is a philosopher, wrote a recent book called Games Agency as Art, I believe it's called, and said something along the lines that games are ways in which we can share different forms of agency. I love that because I think it's true that within the rules of a system, uh, and we all have different rules, physical rules um, within our own bodies and, and, and rules we live by. We all have to make money in order to survive these days, that kind of thing. We have different forms of agency and games are great because as humans, we can take on different forms of agency. So games are a way to model new forms of agency and perspectives. And I do think games can help generate a little more empathy. So. I don't want to go too far out on a limb with that one. I know it's controversial, but I do think that there's that potential. That's it. Would anyone like to say anything, ask a question for clarification, um, or even make any recommendations, more recommendations for participants? Um, I see some folks in the moderation panel, Shivana, uh, Joycelyn, Jessica, Aneshka. I don't know if you wanted to get on video, but I'd be happy to invite you on or if anyone else would like to be on, let me know. Um, all right, catalysts for system changes, John. Um, you know, I think the catalysts for systemic change are oftentimes, um, Unfortunately, uh, empathy, and that's a hard thing for humans these days, it seems like, but hopefully I think with the Black Lives Matter protests and the awareness, hopefully there is more increased empathy. Um, I think that's a big catalyst. I think another catalyst is um, realizing that we're coming to terms with the fact that a system is broken. And again, as I said earlier in the talk, Failure helps us see systems. Oftentimes we just take them for granted, but when we see failures, then we begin to see, uh, hopefully, that the system needs to change. Uh, let's see, Ooh, a lot of questions. Um, Stephen, I'm happy to stick around. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there is a, uh, a group, but uh, Kyler, did you wanna ask a question on video? I hope. 
Oh, no. <laughs> oh, there you are. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, thank you so much for your uh, discussion on this topic. Uh, I, I was curious. I, I'm really fascinated by the idea of gamifying everyday processes. Um, one thing that uh, it, it's going to sound a little bit silly, but um, things that stick out to mind uh, for me are processes that we have to go through every day that are not necessarily the most pleasurable. So, mm -hmm. like, one thing that's always stuck with me as like the perfect example of this is like urinals, like being gamified. And uh, what I, I, I'm curious about, you know, in general, what they don't necessarily have to be things that we encounter every day like that. Um, but what are some systems that you don't think have been optimally gamified that you would like to see more in that direction? Oh, wow. That's really a great um, question. Um... You know, one of the problems, uh, so I've brought this up in previous talks, but there's a game called Spent, and I think that game is incredible. It's a great game. Uh, many people are familiar with it. It's won many awards, and it's a wonderful game with a really good mission, which is to uh, basically raise awareness about what it's like to live in poverty, to live at the edge of your ability to make, <clears throat> pay your bills. Uh, and in that game, you're presented with certain scenarios, uh, and you have to make choices about what you want to do. If your car breaks down, do you fix your car or do you take the bus to work? Um, you know, if you have a toothache, do you get it looked at or do you kind of power on? Um, there's a variety of uh, what do you buy at the grocery store? So there's all kinds of choices that you can make. Now, there was a study that came out in psych psychology today about that game. And in the study, uh, it was a school teacher who had about 100 of her students, or maybe it was less, it could have been 50. I, anyway, um, I'm happy to share the link to that if I can drag it up. Um, had students play that game and measured through pre and post surveys um, whether or not the game increased empathy around uh, being in poverty. Unfortunately, <laughs> several students showed that after playing the game, they had less empathy for those in poverty uh, because they equated the fact that people are in poverty, poverty to making bad choices. Because as the game does, it presents you with some choices. If you make the wrong ones, you may not meet your bills. I think it's a wonderful game. And many people have increased empathy after playing that game, but some don't. And why is that? We need more studies along those lines, but I think that games can, unfortunately, when they give choice and meaningful choice to players, can incorrectly model systems. We know that when you're in poverty, you don't always have the ability to even spend time thinking about the choices you're making. Right. Cognition declines, all kinds of things happen when you're at the edge of being able to survive. So the problem with the game and I, here I am, like, I, I shouldn't even be criticizing such an amazing game. But the problem with that game is that it boils down to choice. Um, and some players take that literally. If I were to change that game, I would say, let's make, let's make it impossible <laughs> to make the right choices. But then you sacrifice the gameplay. So it's a really interesting paradox. I would say that Dysphoria by Anna Anthropy is an interesting approach to choice because no matter what you do, you move forward in the story, right? You're not necessarily um, the agent with full power in that story. It's Anna, and you're hearing Anna's story. So I think that that game is a really great uh, alternate perspective on the idea of choice. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. I. Uh, it's Thank funny. you, Kyler. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I I really appreciate that in particular um, because I, I was looking at working on something similar to Spent and someone mentioned that study to me and it kind of dissuaded me. But uh, you mentioning that uh, kind of reopens the possibility in my head. So you can do it. You can yeah. do it. You can, Thank you. you can, yeah, you can raise awareness. And uh, sometimes that means breaking the game, but that's OK. <laughs> and we share the same glasses, too. So there we go. I love it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
we got seven more minutes. What what else? Can, oh, hey, Jonathan, how are you? It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. My oh. mirror neurons are mighty, so check out my Colleen Macklin costume. I love it so much. You I look fantastic. Have, uh, the backward game hat. Conference, um, <laughs> uh, badge on. Um, this is great. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, formally invite you to another workshop that we're having this afternoon. I hope you can join where we, we pick up where um, a lot of game jams leave off and, and you know, take a, an existing prototype just maybe a couple of inches further. And I Ooh. see Sabrina Selba is also in the chat. Um, oh, a lot of these games came from the uh, Games for Change uh, XR Brain Jam workshop that she and Dave uh, would normally run at this time. So oh, that's fantastic. When is that and what is it called? It's called Five Open Projects, basically. Oh my God, Jonathan, thank you for mentioning that because I think it's a great follow on to what we've been talking about here. Yeah, it started uh, out as 20 open projects for 2020 because like just as you, you discovered, like you could just start boiling the ocean real quickly. <laughs> you know, all the problems we have to solve. Um, There's a lot to do. <laughs> by, by just taking ones that had been um, developed at Games for Change. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. I hope to see you there. Yeah, right on. Mariette, I love the idea of a system of mini games for a good approach to modeling a broad, far reaching systems model. Um, remember, if you remember that map with those clouds on the edges, it'd be really interesting to give students an assignment to make a, a, a map of a system, map out as far as they can go, and then make little games about each of those elements. That would be um, kind of an incredible project. And maybe I'll take that idea to my class for the fall. Um, Dokia, about resources on games and empathy, uh, there's been some good writing on that. I, I'm not thinking of anything off the top of my head. I'm terrible on the spot like this with references. Um, but I think Me Too Kandak, our uh, colleague of mine who teaches over at NYU, has done some PhD research in empathy and XR. Um, and I think there's a, a, probably some good literature in game studies. Uh, which is a journal, peer reviewed journal that has some really good, good lit on that stuff. And other folks, we can crowdsource other folks too. Hey, Brendan, did you want to uh, ask a question? Oh, come on, come hey. on online. I'm here. Oh, Hello. Brendan, there you are. Hey. Can you? Hear me? Hey. Um, yeah. Uh, I came in a little late, so so forgive me if this is redundant, okay. but. Um, you know, I, I used to do a ton of work with systems uh, and teaching systems thinking. And so you're talking about using systems thinking as a way to, you know, teach Make different sense. topics. But what about the, I feel like, you know, the, the, the main mission of the Institute of Play, especially in its early years, was to actually empower people through giving them systems literacy. I wonder if there's any work or any opportunity that you see there in continuing that, that building that literacy in everyone. Because it just, it's, it's so incredibly power, empowering, not just to make games and teach through games, but for anyone to understand any part of the world. It's just one of the most powerful ways to think about things. Oh my God, the uh, Institute of Play and um, the school Quest to Learn and uh, associated things. Um, my, my friend and colleague, Katie Salen, has done some incredible work along those lines. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, when we're in school, we learn to like write book reports and, and try to reflect on things. And that's a really important skill to have, right? Is to be able to tell a story about your understanding of something. But games are the pop cultural form of systems, right? They're how we as folks, you know, learn how systems work because we're given a little mini system and we play with it and we see feedback and we see stuff going on. Um, so, that's a great way to learn about systems, but an even better way is to make a game. And, you know, that's that's kind of where I'm at in terms of my education, like what I'm trying to teach and work on as an educator is how to introduce game making in an effort to understand the world better. And then through playtesting, you understand people better too in psychology because you see how many things break. Yep, I've um, experienced it too. <laughs> but I hope that's a good answer for your question. Um, I'm hoping to write a book out of some of the system stuff um, that I've started and need to keep working on. Um, but it is it is not, yeah, systems, dynamics, and games. This is a much bigger thing. Rules of Play, the book by uh, Eric Zimmerman and Kay Katie Salen, Tech and Boss, are an incredible place. It talks about systems too. Um, so I'm not the only one 
uh, talking through these issues. Um, but I do think learning to make games is a great way of feeling more empowered because you're modeling small systems and making changes. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, David, <laughs> Avi. Uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, we got Steven and Kavan. Um, and I think we can go over a little bit. I know many of you have other sessions to get to, and I won't be hurt if you leave. That's OK. Hey, how you doing, Kyle? Hey, good. Am I pronouncing your name right? Uh, close, Kayvon. Kayvon, cool. Yeah. It's nice to meet you. Uh, it's nice to meet you, too. And you've been amazing over the past couple of days. Um, oh, thank you. This is an amazing session. Um, my question to you is, um, how do we integrate this, um, these strategies in real life, right? So I mean, I feel like this is an awesome question, but how do we integrate it? Well, essentially, how do we gamify this in our mm -hmm. everyday conversation, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I think it's one thing to intentionally create these spaces, but it, it'd be awesome to be able to weave them into our everyday sort of iterative, you know, random conversations where we can just solve problems on the fly. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's so many ways. I mean, for those who are initiated into the game space, I think that there's a little bit uh, more of an openness to the idea of games being a tool for understanding and learning about systems. Um, for others in the activism space, um, um, uh, Adrian Marie Brown, I think is the correct name, uh, Emergent Strategies is an incredible book that also kind of looks at systems from a very different perspective, um, more from the organizing space. And I think that that's a really great way to start thinking about um, how in activism and in organizing, we can begin to integrate system stuff. Because the problem, I think, with systems dynamics as a field when it emerged in the 50s and 60s is that it was a little bit, um, it was very business focused. Uh, and it was, uh, kind of viewed as a kind of magic bullet, when in fact, it's more about paradigm shifts and how people perceive things um, and kind of, you know, starting there. But I think the big message, especially when you're like making games and, and playing with systems yourself, when you're modeling little systems, is that we have the ability to change the rules and change these systems. Even if it's climate change, which is, part of a natural system, we're the ones who are impacting that system in a way that needs to be changed. So we can make changes. Um, and, you know, we can also question the goals of the systems that we live in. Right, right. So Kate Raworth, Donut Economics, pick up that book, check it out. I mean, these are the kinds of ways we need to change those paradigms. We need to get to that leverage point that Danella Metas describes as the most powerful um, and change the way you think about that system, change the goal of that system. Awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that book. Um, <laughs> oh, good. I'm everybody, I'm everybody in the chat put a one up, put a thumbs <laughs> up if you think she should write that book. That, oh, that helps that. because writing is hard. It I would rather be designing games, but I knew I do I, in my heart I feel like this book needs to be written. So thank you so much. <laughs> uh, this is awesome. Thank you. Thanks again. Um I'll leave you to get to the next person. Thank you, Kayvon. So nice to meet you. Steven. Hey, Colleen. Thanks for Hey. I want to say I love your enthusiasm and your mix of oh, optimism with optimism in this because there's a <laughs> lot to lot to tackle. Oh yeah. I want to talk about that example of uh, poverty, if I can for a second. I've seen a lot of portrayals of poverty that make it into choice. And as someone who's gotten into this industry after having grown up in poverty, I think mm -hmm. that they're missing the reality that poverty is something you're born with in most cases. 70% yeah. of people born into poverty will never make it to middle class at any point in their life, let alone stay there. Um, to me, yeah. I think about moments when I was a kid, like when I would go into my kitchen and say, hey, mom, can we have something for lunch? I remember the day that she didn't have anything to give to lunch and she broke down crying. That's the kind of thing that stays with a person. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And rather than putting you in the shoes of the person who is trying to struggle and survive financially in poverty, I've yet to see a game put you in the shoes of someone growing up where your family is struggling and you yeah. just have to be there 
seeing it and realizing that your choices very early on can make the difference between your parents even keeping a job. Yeah. I think that would be powerful and people would empathize with something like that. So I hope I can see it someday. Stephen, um, thank you for sharing your own experience. It's, uh, uh, you know, I think if you can make that game, uh, that's what we need. We need games made by people who have experienced things and able to translate that experience in ways that are powerful um, and um, true to, to what, what happens in life, right? Um, so we need more of that truth in games. And I think one of the problems we were trying to tackle it today is diversity in games. You know, it's like having people come from all kinds of perspectives, experiences, making games um, it is so important. And um, Stephen, I think you're right. I think that that the 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 perspective through which the game is made is probably the most important thing in terms of representing a system. Systems represent perspectives too. Especially yeah. when we model them, we're bringing our own subjectivity to those models. Um, and so we need perspectives <laughs> and new ones. Absolutely. Thank you for letting me uh, have a moment. Oh, to talk. Yeah, I'm so glad you joined. Christina. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, can you hear me? Right. I can. I can okay. hear you great. Okay. Um. I actually had a question similar to the one before. So basically, um. I also I've been thinking and I've been in the works of making a game about my country, Venezuela. Um. Mm. Maybe some people might know that there's like a lot of issues going on there, but I would like to know that um. If um. Regard <laughs> regarding the expert part, is it right to just show one perspective or is it like the one I want to show or is it important to show all the perspectives so the player or the person like experiencing the game can like get where I'm coming from or what am I what I want to show I would like to know like what kind of stuff <laughs> well Christina it sounds like we need that game from your perspective really <laughs> Um, you know, I guess it depends on your educational goals um, and what you're trying to convey. Um, when we were creating Budget Ball, uh, I didn't really know much about the federal debt. Uh, now I feel like I do. I've, I've, I've been learning through making games more than I do by reading. Yeah, games. me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that um, we ended up hearing from experts and they were all saying very different things and we were very confused and we didn't know is federal debt good or bad. and I would say now it's good for us to go into debt to help people survive um, at this point in history. Um, so you kind of have to filter all of those expert opinions uh, if you want to make a game that you're hoping accurately represents an issue. And one of the things we chose to do with Budget Ball is not say if something was good, if debt is good or bad. We just said, hey, it feels great to go into debt. It doesn't feel like great to pay more taxes let's talk about this let's talk about these feelings let's talk about why uh we could, we do go into that um that was meant to kind of portray the federal deficit in a way that we felt like was pretty accurate uh, uh if you want to convey a, an opinion about it though you don't necessarily need to take all of the opinions into account you need to know what they are but you need to present your own opinion i think that um you know, we can think about games as a propaganda and, it, and they are, and I think a lot of games for change kind of lean towards that. I hope when I make a game to be able to create something that people will debate and discuss afterwards um, so that uh, I'm not trying to put ideas in somebody's head, but hopefully just give them a better sense of a system and ask even more questions afterwards. Yeah, that's what I was trying to see because sometimes people might think oh well um it's you're putting this perspective but you're not talking about these other things so that's what i wanted yeah. to avoid so no one yeah. gets i guess um offended or like think that i'm trying to put something on their head but yeah yeah danella meadows says a really great thing in her book thinking and system she says you know all you're doing when you map a system or create something she wasn't thinking about games but but she probably would have if I would have ever met her and we could have talked. But um, uh, she 
said, just you have to put it out there. You have to put your model out there for other people to react to, to talk about and debate because it's simply a model. Um, and I do think it's important to recognize that. Too. Thank you so much for answering. And I love this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. All right, we might have time for one more question here. Uh, Jessica is joining us, hopefully. Can I? Hi. Hey. Hi. It's uh, good to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. Um, I am also working on, on system name games, and I really loved and appreciated your workshop. It was really great. Thank you. And then also a question uh, which popped up a lot in the chat was, how do you draw the lines when you make a game? So what are actually, how would you maybe give an advice on where do you create system boundaries? Um, oh, God, that's such... We have been struggling a lot with those things when we created a game. I, I was involved in a game with like um, sustainability and tourism, and we created a system for a city. It's like even a system for a city, it's huge, right? So maybe you can give a yeah. bit of advice. <laughs> okay. So there's something in the book that John Sharp and I wrote, uh, Games, mm -hmm. Design, and Play, that we call design values. And we actually have a a worksheet that you fill out with your design values. Yeah. And I think that that is one of the ways in which you can kind of uh, constrain the systems that you're trying to describe and show, yeah. because there's really, there's really like in the games, you're designing goals, right? It's like get the most points before the clock runs out. Yeah. But then there's also another goal. And that goal is usually aesthetic or educational or, yeah. you know, representational. So, if you as, and your team have a very strong goal that you want the game to accomplish, yeah, uh, and if it's specific enough, but not too specific, but not too big, um, then, and, and if you use the how might we question, which I kind of glossed over in the presentation, mm -hmm. but it's helpful, um, then hopefully what you can do is figure out what parts of that system are necessary in order to, con to convey that goal. And then there's a third goal. There's three goals. So there's the goal of the game. There's the goal of the team or the what you want yeah. the game to do yeah. in the world. Yeah. And then the third goal is let's make a game that people want to play. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fun, yeah. right? Uh, we'll get into fun some other time. But um, uh, so that's that part is what really impacted the design of Budget Ball we realized we came up with like 10 different designs and some of them were like very simulation-y mm -hmm. where you had a budget you needed to balance and you had Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security and all the things in the United States that lead to the federal deficit as levers. Yeah. And we quickly realized it, we couldn't get college students to volunteer to play that unless we had free beer and pizza. Um, so we made a sport that looked fun and that was fun in order to get people to actually even just play the game in the first place. Um, and then the final thing I'll say. Uh, and so we did have to really narrow down that system and just make it the major levers. We did, we had to get rid of all the elements like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, because it would just bog it down. Yeah, otherwise you can do like 10 different games, right? So Yeah. yeah. So maybe it's like a triangle, right? It's yeah. like the game's got to be fun at the top. And then you know you've got the goal of the game, what the players are trying to accomplish, and then you, as a team, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, thanks for helping me think through that. But I think that uh, it's it's yeah, you got to draw the lines somewhere. So start with your design values as a team. I think that might be helpful. Okay. Thank you, Kareem. It was really informative. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh boy, I think this is it. I'm a, I'm a, I'm spent. Speaking of spent, um, um, and I think that uh, uh, I really appreciate you staying and participating and giving great comments and questions. And I wish I could have answered them all. I'm sorry I couldn't. Um, but to be continued, right? Uh, this is an effort that we're together, and hopefully we'll figure out how to game those systems, to change them and make the world a little bit better, or at least to understand it better so we can make it better. 
something like that. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.